interesting. Hold on a second. Um, All right, can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can. Yep, yes. Awesome. Okay, so for this evening's presentation, as um, Sarah has already told you, it is called Elevate Your Faith. And we're just gonna go through some practical steps on how to build your faith. Um, I like to keep things simple, you know, that even a child can understand. Um, I speak with my hands, so you're going to you're gonna see a lot of hand movements. Um, but let's get right into it with a quick word of prayer. Um, let's pray, dear Heavenly Father. I thank you for bringing us all here as women. Um, I absolutely love this, Lord, and I just pray that your, your spirit will be with us. Teach us, guide us, Lord. Let me not be seen, but let you be seen, Lord. And let me go forward from where we are right now and be a blessing to those that will come in contact with and may we leave here, Lord, with stronger faith so that we can please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So as we, as I was going through this, present, um, putting this presentation together, I realized that there are two sides to growing faith. There is a spiritual side, a spiritual side where you cannot see, you know, this part involves God, this part involves heaven, um, and the, the warfare that's going on behind the scene that, that you cannot see. And then the second part of growing faith is the physical part that involves more of you, more of me. And so the two sides are going to come together, as you, as you will see, that will create this powerful balance of faith, which is spiritual, and works. And so what is faith? Like if we're trying to have something, we want to know what it is, right? What is faith? So Hebrews 11 verses one says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if you read it in different translations or if you read it in the Hebrew, it says it's the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Two more de um, definition of what faith is, is from dictionary.com. It says, um, confidence or trust in a person or thing. And the third definition is belief that is not based on proof, right? So we have a Bible definition of what faith is and we have dictionary.com and they both, they're all, all these um, explanation of what faith is, is actually 100% accurate because Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and it's a, it's a confidence or trust in a person or thing, and it's based on not having any proof. Let's continue. So who are we to have faith in? Who are we to hope in? Who are we to have faith in? Um, and I hope, ladies, that you have access to a Bible, because we're going to be using the Bible today. Um, I want when you leave here, you're not going to leave what Stashana said or Sarah said or somebody else said, but you're actually going to leave with the word of God. Um, so who are we to hope in or who are we to have faith in? Who, who are we supposed to trust? We're supposed to have faith in a person, right? So who is this person? Isaiah 26 verse 4 says, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26 verse 4 is telling you to trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3 verses 5 says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And this one is a very popular verse that a lot of us know. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, meaning not just to trust in him sometimes or just part of you or uh, can you, I don't know. No, trust in the Lord with your whole heart. And we're going to see you know, later on that, you know, you can trust him. Is he trustworthy? Psalm 118 verses eight to nine says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And I know from my experience, from my, you know, time on this earth that people fail you. People are, you know, they're sinful just like you. They make mistakes. They, you know, they do you wrong. They say they love you one minute, one minute they don't love you. 
And I've found from my personal experience that I can trust God more than I can trust somebody that I can see. Because as I said, people will hurt you. People are going to hurt you. Um, and it's just a matter of how you deal with it. The question that I wanna throw out to you, and you don't have to answer, but you can just speak within yourself, is do you know him? Do you know God? Um, who is this God that you know, we're supposed to trust even the word, like, can we trust the word? Can we trust the God who created, who made this word and gave it to us? Can we trust him? Do we know him? And so the question again, can we hope, can we have faith in God? John 10 verses 35 says scripture cannot be broken. Time and time again, people have tried to prove the word of God to be um, false. They say, oh, it's written by man. But every single time, God himself vindicates his scripture. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Dead Sea Scroll. They're always, men is always trying to go against the word of God to say that, oh, it was written by man. So are your textbooks. So are the other books that we read every day. And nobody questioned those things. Why is it that we question the word of God? Okay, so God has, a, God has an answer. And one thing I love about him is that he always vindicates his name. You can try to defend God, but when God steps up, he defends himself also. And so years ago, they, there was a guy who was throwing stones in a, in a clay, in a cave. It was just, you know, the rock throwing when guys love to throw stones. We love to throw stones too, but he was throwing stones and he threw a stone in the cave and he heard a clink or a crack. And then when they went in there, they discovered that there were, it was maybe like 90 something, 98% of the New Testament, of the New and the Old Testament, the whole Bible preserved. And it was basically word for word to the new, the King James version that we have today. So man will always say, oh, you can't trust the Bible. It's written by man. But here is God showing you how many hundreds of years ago that here's a perfectly preserved Bible that you can trust that it has not been changed. Yes, you have different versions. Yes, you have different um, prints and stuff that come out, these newer ones, but the word of God will, will stand forever and it cannot be broken. I also want you to think about what is God's track record? Is there a time in your life that, or that of others where God has led you wrong? And a lot of times if we were to just stop and think, and this is one of my, my biggest struggle, me and God, we argue about it all the time. And it's like somebody taking you on a roller coaster. You don't know if there is the roller coaster is safe. You don't know if there's a hole at the bottom. You don't know if you're going to get, you know, fall out. Like getting to know God and learning to trust him is nothing short of a roller coaster because he takes your hand and he says, trust him. And I'm like, wait, well, where are we going? Who are we going with? What are we coming back? Who are like, all these questions. And he's saying, trust me. And from the years of experience that I've had with him, I can look back and say that he has never led me wrong and he will never lead me wrong. And I 100% believe that when you look back in your life, the track record, because even if you find somebody who claims you're not Christian or maybe an atheist, they can look back and pinpoint some point in my life where something miraculous happened in their favor where God came through for them or somebody who they don't know that is God came through for them. And, you know, he, he has never led you wrong and he will never lead you wrong. So look back at the situations in your life, look back at the, the scenarios. And I'm gonna tell you a story later on that actually ties into this because the Holy Spirit loves to, you know, to take, take you back to things that you've been through to help you go through what you're going through now. But I'll continue. Second thing is to, to get to know him, right? Can, you can trust somebody you don't know. And that is, you know, let's look at like John 5 verse 39, real quick. John 5 verse 39. Tell you we're gonna use some Bible today, right? John 5 verse 39 says, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. One of the easiest way to get to know God, and as I said before, you cannot, you will not trust somebody you don't know. If you're walking down the street and somebody comes up to you and say, hey, give me your credit card number, give me a social security number, give me, um, give me your address. They're gonna be like, what, who are you? I don't know you, get away from me. 
you don't know that person. So you're not going to trust them with those personal sensitive information of yours. So it is with God. If you don't know him, you're not going to want to trust him. You're not going to trust his leading. You're not going to trust his advice. You're not going to trust his guidance. So you have to get to know him. And one of the main ways to get to know him is through his word. You can ask questions, ask people and God about himself. There are people in your life that they've been through stuff. Some people are a little shy and, and wanting to share their experience and talk about what they've been through. But if you ask the right people, they will share their experience of God and they'll give you testimonies. And again, that's why Fireproof Faith is there. It shares people's experiences and testimonies that you would not have otherwise known. And it makes you want to get to know that guy because who is that guy that did that for that person and did that for that person. And this person talks so highly about who is that God, I wanna to get to know him. And one thing that I know is that you can ask God, you can talk to him. He's not just sitting up there on this big porcelain throne and just living a good life and watching us suffer down here and so indifferent towards us, no. He actually wants you to talk to him. If you don't know who he is, if you don't believe in him, ask him. And I've heard so many testimonies of people who are atheists or who are having a hard time believing God and they reach out to him and say, God, if you're real, if you're there, do such and such, show me such and such, reveal such and such. And you think God is going to miss out on an opportunity to reveal himself to somebody who he loves so much? He absolutely does. And he did. And so he reveals himself to those people. Another thing is reading the word and being in an atmosphere that fosters a relationship with God that will help you, right? So yes, reading the word, but also being around people that are Christians, people who are God-fearing, people who like themselves are trying to get to where you're trying to go. And nature is one way to get to know him. You can watch documentaries if you don't have access to nature. Um, you know, it's, nature is kind of like an autobiography of God. Um, when you take time to see how he painted the flowers, and the colors on the flowers, the trees, the mountains, the, the, the stars, the, the heavens, you know, like I live in the country and so I, I get these little ladybugs and you're like, okay, it's a ladybug. What's so special about a ladybug? When you look at the, their little ladybugs got little spots on them. And it's incredible to see that the God of creation he took time to paint spots on a little ladybug. Like who would take the time to put spots on a bug? You know, so we often think about God as being this big and mighty and oh, he just can't wait to burn us up. And no, he's a God who puts spots on a ladybug and, you know, paint flowers and put all the little details into nature. And it reveals his gentleness, his, his character is seen. Um, so another thing that will help you to get to know God is to get rid of distractions that take up your time and things that do not nurture holiness, such as movies, music, social media, and people, <laughs> people. There, I don't know if many of you might know of Little Light Studios, LED Live, they do a lot of um, uh, presentations on movies and music and social media and the effects that it have on your mind. And a lot of these things are designed and created by demonic people. And there's stuff going on the screen, flashing on the screen that, you know, it, it, it numbs your spirituality and it takes away the love for eternal and heavenly things. And by the time you're done watching these movies, listening to these songs, by the time you take up your Bible, it's like a snooze face. You're falling asleep. You're just like, oh yeah, five minutes and you're done, right? But yet we can sit and we'll watch, you know, and listen to music and stuff for hours. But when it comes to spiritual things, it's so hard for God to get us into the word because these things are designed to be addictions, addictive. Um, and there are people who, people are probably going to be your biggest, your biggest um, trial because Satan uses people so effectively because they're the ones you interact with, you love, some of them you love, some of them are family, some of them are friends. And if they are spiritually numb or are not trying to go in the direction you're going to go, you're trying to go in, they're going to discourage you. They're going to talk down to you. They're going to talk at you. They're going to be like, oh, that stuff is nonsense. No, you know, so you have to be around people that will help you to get to where you're going. The same way you go to seminars that will help you to become business minded and start a business and to do this and to do that and all these workshops, 
you need to be around people that will also help you to foster a relationship with God. And that is, is so important. We're going to come back to that later. Continuing. Pray and communicate. I, the, we say, you know, this is kind of like the obvious or whatnot, but prayer is actually like the breath of the soul. It's how we communicate with God. And it doesn't need to be formal. You don't have to be on your knees. You don't have to, um, you know, like be on a prayer mat somewhere. You can talk to God. Your eyes don't have to be closed. You could be in bed. It can be in the toilet. You could be in the shower. It could be wherever you are. And if you want to talk to God, you can talk to him. It could be a thought. It could just be a question. It just talk, just open your mouth, open your mind, talk to him. Because while we're seeking to have faith and be strong in it, we have to communicate with the one who gives power to do so. Mark 1 verse 39 says, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he, Jesus, went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Jesus, who died for us, who was God in human form, got up in the mornings, early before everyone else would get up, and he went to a secret little location and prayed and spoke with his father. And this is important because I want you to see in John 15, verses 5, this is why John 15 verses 5, John 15 verses 5 says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot to bear fruit of itself. Now remember, we're trying to bear fruit of, um, of faith, right? Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. And let's go to five verses 19. Five verses 19 says, then answered Jesus and said unto them, verily, verily I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do for whatsoever thing, whatsoever things, sorry, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Jesus, who was God in human form, said that he could do nothing of himself. He got all his power, all his strength from the Father. And if Christ, being God, being man, needed to go to the Father to get strength to do that which his Father was asking him to do, how much more us who are sinful? So if we're trying to have faith, we have to go to the faith giver, the source of where all that faith is coming from, all that strength, all that power is coming from. Because Jesus said of himself, he can do nothing. Of ourselves, we can do nothing. I know that I've been struggling, right, to exercise different levels of faith because as God takes you to one level, he takes you to another. This, it's, like a, it's like a cake, right? First, you'll maybe say, okay, move the, your faith needs to move the rubber band. Okay, then your faith move the rubber band. Now he wants your faith to move the table. Then he wants your faith to move the car. Then he wants your faith to move the building, then the mountain. And so he takes you through these levels where he wants your faith to be strong. He wants your faith to be elevated. So the trials and the difficulties as they come, you will be able to meet them. And so you have to go to the one who gives that power to the one who gives that strength because Jesus says of himself he could do nothing which means we have to be we have to follow Jesus is, is Jesus's example and go to God so we have to pray communicate with him and at the bottom I said make him your first and your last your bae right before anything else you need to be going to God early in the morning if you can you know in the in the middle of the day you speak up, you talk to God, say, Lord, you know what? You know, my head hurts or my foot hurts or what, you know, what are you doing with my life? Talk to him. In the evenings, prioritize him. The same way you prioritize your husband, your boyfriend, your siblings, your family, the ones you love, spend time with God and make him a priority in your life. Um, you know, because the same way you build a relationship with anyone by communicating and spending time with them is the same way you build a relationship with God. I know 
you can't see him, but he requires the same things. He's, you know, he's, he's God, but he got feelings too, just like the rest of us. So now we go into the more physical part of growing in faith. So we looked at the spiritual aspect of it, which is connecting with God, praying, communicating with him, reading the word, like those things are the spiritual side. Now here is the active part where you have to activate your faith into works. Um, and this part is solely, so like all dependent on you. So Mark 9 verse 23 says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. What? If thou canst believe, so okay, wait, so I have to believe that all things are possible. Hmm. So if I'm 30, 50, 60 years old, and I'm trying to do something that's impossible. I first have to believe that it is possible. Hmm. Okay, let's look at Mark eleven twenty three. 23. He says, therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. So here is that believing part now. This is you. You have to start believing. Let's look at James 2, 16. I'm going to turn in our Bibles to James 2, verses 16, and we're going to read down to 26. All right. And one of you say, reading from verses 16, and one of you say, yes. Maybe, maybe give us, give us, give us two minutes, sis. To find the scripture. Okay, okay, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> I am that swift. <laughs> James two. Okay, yes. I reach. I reach. I, you got okay. it. Yeah, okay. I don't know if everybody. Sometimes you know, we mightn't be that quick in finding. If I'm going too fast, tell me to slow down. I do talk fast. No, you're good. Okay. Are we got it? James two verses sixteen to twenty six. All right, I'm reading. Okay. And one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou dost well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain woman, <laughs> that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham or father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And I read this because sometimes we sit down and we pray and we wait and we just sit in there praying and waiting and praying and waiting, and praying and waiting. And there's no active preparation of, you know, of, of, of believing that you're going to receive. Where is the works that will follow with your faith. If you believe that you're gonna get a car, right? If you believe that you're gonna get a car, um, start looking up insurance, start looking for, um, you know, maybe a house with a garage, that, that's what you're looking for. If you believe that you're gonna get married soon, all right, where is your dress? Where are the plan where are the plannings? If you believe that you're gonna have a child, okay, where is the crib, where is the baby stuff? God is saying, where is your works that will profess that you believe what you're asking for that you will receive? We have a part to play. The same way all these examples of what God is saying that, you know, Noah, Noah had faith, he believed that God, but he made the ark. 
So there was a physical preparation on his part. Rahab believed she put the, she had the, the messages, she put the cord, the red cord out her window. All of these people had works to go along with their faith. And one thing that we do that I know this pleases God, and I do it sometimes, may God forgive me, and I'm learning, and I'm growing. But I, you pray, I pray, and we believe, but we worry, and we question, and we go, well, God, when is this reaching? Like, why is it taking so long? Are you sure you're going to give me? And uh, we go back and forth, and we just grieve in the Holy Spirit. And God has to come, and he go, whoop, what did my word say? And I'm like, oh, uh, you say to trust you, that you know what you're doing? And we have to start believing and we have to stop worrying because if you, if you believe that you're going to get something, you wait patiently for it and you prepare for it. You don't sit there anxious, you know, afraid, worried, nervous. No, if you believe like, you know, how Jesus was on the boat when the, the storm was kicking up and the boat was about to sink and the disciples were just frantic thinking that they're going to drown and Jesus was asleep. He was asleep because he trusted his father. He believed that his father would keep them safe. And it's that faith that we need to have. But here's a disclaimer, John 1 verses, um, 1 John 5 verses 14, let's go there. 1 John, 1 John 5 verses 14, give me a second. 1 John 5, verses 14, before Jude and Revelation. And it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, disclaimer number one, he says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. A lot of times we ask things of God that's not his will, not because he don't love you, not because he doesn't want to bless you, but one, the timing is not right, or two, is not good for you. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, I was looking for... I was looking for a room to rent because I had to move from where I was living. Now I went to this lady's house and she had, she had all the space and I was like, oh, you know, I need this room because I can't find anywhere and I don't have the money because the area where I live in is really expensive, okay? Unless you want to sell your kidneys, you really can't, can't afford a, a, a studio apartment. And so I went to this lady and I asked and I was like, you know, she said, oh, she'll think about it and let me know. And so I was praying and I was pleading with God. I was like, God, please let her give me the room. I can't find anything else. It's close by. It's not far from where I need to go. And I was just going over this list of why I needed it and why God needed to give it to me. And when she called me back, she was like, oh, okay, so how long are you going to need to stay? You know, Island people. So how long are you going to need to stay? And I was like, oh gosh, okay. So I don't want to go somewhere that I am rushed out. I'm already stressed as it is. And so here is this lady already adding pressure to me and I haven't moved in. And mind you, I'm paying for the room and I asked me for free. <laughs> and when I realized that that's not where God wanted me, ooh, I was so mad. I was like, where do you want me to go? You know, I can't afford anywhere else. And I was just falling down the place and I was so mad, I was so frustrated. Fast forward a couple weeks later, I was so mad, I was done. I was like, I'm moving out of Jersey area. I'm going to Tennessee. <laughs> Cause you know, cost of living down is a little, a little different, especially compared to New York City, you know, across the bridge, Teaneck area, cause that's where I was living, it's expensive. So I was like, I'm done, I'm moving to Tennessee. And so I typed in jobs in Nashville, Tennessee and this house sitting job comes up. I was like, what is this? I didn't type in no house sitting job. Google normally gives you what you ask for. And even some stuff you don't really ask because they're Google, right? So I'm clicking on this thing out of frustration to get it off the screen. And I saw this house sitting position come up and I'm like, what is this nonsense? So I clicked on it and it was just God's mercy blocking my, my, my consciousness to say, you're going to ignore this and I want you to click on it. So click on it. So I clicked on it, saw the number, called the lady and 
the morning I called the number because it was really early and she picked up and she was like, oh, you know, normally I didn't, I don't pick up this early, but she was expecting a call. So I was like, oh, well, uh, well, I saw your posting on housesitters.com and um, I was wondering if you're still looking for a house sitter. She was like, well, yes and no. Um, I kind of want somebody to live in the house. I was like, what? Did she just say she wants somebody to live in? I was like, well, you know, I, I kind of, I need to move. So I'm looking for somewhere to live. Long story short, y'all, this woman ended up having me live in her house for almost two years. Rent free, okay? Rent free, no utilities, no red. All I had to do was shovel the snow and send her her mail. And a couple of weeks before I was bawling down the place because God would not give me the room that I was asking for. Y'all think I'm making this story up. I'll give you the address. I'll give you the ladies now. It 100%. God told me no about something I was asking for and I was mad. Only for him to say, oh, my child, my child, this is what I wanted to give you. A whole three bedroom, two and a half bath, fully furnished newly renovated kitchen and bathroom to myself for free rent free for almost two years when I moved into that place and I remember the year I said to God you know God I would love to have Thanksgiving in my own place and I moved the lady wanted me to move in the week sometime in December and she called me back and she said you know what are your plans for Thanksgiving? And I was like, I don't know. She's like, okay, well, I'm moving early. So if you want to move in by Thanksgiving, you can, you can have Thanksgiving here. And it didn't hit me until I was sitting in the house after she left, had the keys, had everything. And it was a day before Thanksgiving. And I realized God had answered my prayer the year before and put me in my own house that I could, my own house, because it was mine, it was his, but he gave it to me, you know what I'm saying? But he put me in my in a house to have the, he answered a prayer. I didn't even remember I prayed. When I tell you I was bowling down, but I was like, God, you love me so much. Why do you love me? It is situations like that when I say, look back and see what God has done and it will strengthen your faith. That is why my faith has grown because I gave myself to him and I give him my desires and I give him these things. I it, it, learning to trust God is a process. I'm going to take you to Isaiah 55. Go with me to Isaiah 55. Um, and we're going to read verses 8 to 9. Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9. Because these are the things that he taught me afterwards. Um, it says, if you're there, 55 verses 8 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we may go to God and say, God, I want this. Give me this. I believe and I should, I should receive because I believe. If God says no and wait or not yet try, Trust him. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God wants to prosper you. He knows the thought of peace that he has towards you. Psalm 39 says, the amount of thoughts of peace that God has towards you, you can't count them. They're, if you take a hand of sand on the beach, handful of sand, if you can't count how many grains of sand you have, God says, I have thoughts of peace as the sand on the seashore. You cannot count them. So when he says to trust him and to act according to his will, we have to trust that God knows what is best for us and not just what is best. Cause you know, sometimes the parents then give you peer licks and they say, it's best for you. This is not like that. God is literally giving you what is best for you. And it's not, you're gonna be ecstatic. Do you think if God had shown me, and this is where the not seeing to believe thing comes in. You think God, God has shown me the one bedroom sharing kitchen bathroom with a lady I really don't know. She's seen me in any ways. Compared to a fully furnished, fully big, pretty house, you know, you, what would you choose? You would choose the big house with, you know, living by yourself rent free. But faith requires you to not see that. You have to believe 
that what God is doing for you is what is best for you and will be, you, you'll be happier. And it's situations like that that has helped my faith to grow because when I look back and see how I'm bawling over something that I think I want that I don't know that's not good for me when God has something better, these are the situations I talk about in learning to trust God. Let's continue. One of the big things that we kind of often overlook, um, and it's kind of obvious, but ask. <laughs> Let's go and see what Matthew, Matthew 7 verse 7 says. Matthew 7 verses 7. Matthew 7 verses 7 says, ask and it shall be given you seek and ye shall find knock and it shall be open unto you we want faith but we don't ask god for faith because sometimes it's hard you know god is saying okay believe but i'm like god i have no faith i don't know how to believe it's hard it's difficult okay ask i said lord give me faith say god give me faith help me to believe help thou my unbelief Ask, he says, and you shall receive because he wants our joy to be full. He wants us to, to prosper. He wants you to be happy. So he's saying to ask him. You can ask him anything. You can ask for a parking space because sometimes we're driving and if we're going into an area that's really crowded and we say, Lord, you know, please, it's hard to find parking, especially in New York City. Lord, as, you know, I'm asking, can you help me find a parking space? He'll help you. Lord, please let there be no traffic. He'll help you. Lord, I'm cooking this rice. God, it's my first time. Please let it turn out good. He'll, like, you can ask, literally ask him for anything. And he's more than willing to, to help and to bless and to help you to understand and to grow, right? Now, this is another part of the practical thing that I have to do and I want you guys to start doing. If you've not done it or you're not doing it or if you're doing it, wonderful. But if you've not done it or you're not doing it, please, this will help you immensely tremendously right god's promises what are his promises and we're going to go through a couple of them real quick um jeremiah 29 11 i think i've gone over that one um so let's go to jeremiah 29 11 really quick jeremiah 29 verse 11 and i put them on the screen so you can write them down it says for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Psalm 39, verses 17 to 18. Sorry, 139, I thought it said 139. Okay, Psalm 139, 17 says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Psalm 37 is one of my favorite passages of scripture. And if you don't know about the book of Psalm, if you're going through nothing, if you're going through anything, pick up the Bible and open the book of Psalms. I promise you, it's like the scriptures start jumping off the page because it's almost exactly what you need to hear. Psalm 37, one of my favorite passages of scripture. The whole, if you got time, read the whole, the whole list of Psalm 37. Um, but Psalm 37 verses four says, delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he, not maybe, but he shall bring it to pass. Psalm 91 is another powerful passage of scripture. Psalm 91. And like I said, again, the whole book of Psalm, but Psalm 91 um, verses 10 says, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their, in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample underfoot, because 
He hath set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known me. We have to familiarize ourselves with the scriptures, with God's promises, because if you and I are friends and I say, yo, I love you. I will never hurt you. And I am showing you all this stuff. I'm showing you all this love. And you forget, you know, if somebody said, you know, Stashana, this big head girl, she mean and she talk bad about people and she said my foot dry. And she said that about you too. What? Are you going to immediately believe what somebody says? What has Stashana shown you? What has Stashana, you know, revealed to you that she loves you, that she will never do that? So you have to familiarize yourself because the enemy, the enemy of souls, right? We're going to get into that in a second, but you have to familiarize yourself and remember God's promises. To your right is a picture. Get little post-its, right? Write all the little promises of God and all the things that he has done for you, all the, the, the desires of your heart, all the things that all like, write them down, put them on the wall, put them in the bathroom, put them in the kitchen, countertop, anywhere you're going to see them, put them. I have reminders set up on my phone to think positive, to praise the Lord, to thank God. So every two hours or so, a reminder pops up, praise the Lord, pray, thank God, be happy, be joyful. Remember he loves you. You have to put them in your mind. Remember what the Lord has said. There's the story, the story of the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 11. And you can read that afterwards. But Deuteronomy 11, basically, when they were about to go into the promised land, the Lord was trying to tell them to remember, remember how I brought you out of Egypt. Remember what I did to the Egyptians for your sake. Remember how I destroyed the armies that came about you. Remember what I've said to you. Remember what I've told you. Remember what I've done. Remember what I did. He was trying to get it into their minds to remember, remember, remember. Because if you remember somebody loves you, remember what he has done, it will be hard to not trust them. Continuing. Reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. As I said, the enemy will not allow you to just walk into this new level of faith because he's trying to lay hold of you for himself. Satan plays for keeps. Okay? Do what Jesus did and send him packing with a thus saith the Lord and it is written. Comes back to his. When Satan came and tempted Jesus, Jesus never said, well, my pastor said, or well, I don't feel. No, he said, it is written. It is written. It is written. My father loves me. His thoughts are of peace towards me. He promises to prosper me. He says he'll never leave me nor forsake me. All of these promises you have, because the enemy, sometimes we feel like these thoughts of doubts come from us. They're the enemy sitting there knowing what God wants to do in your life. And he whispers in your ear, you know, you're sure God love you. You sure he said he gonna do that? You sure you, you sure? And before you know, you're like, oh God, well, then you start questioning. No, no, my sisters, let the scriptures be your safeguard. When the enemy comes, remember the promises. And this is something I have to constantly do. If you come in my room, it's there, post it's post it's there, post it's there, post it's there, post it's all over the place because Satan is, is a roaring lion going about seeking whom he can devour. And whoever he can devour, he's trying. So, Remember the promises of God and, and use the scriptures as your weapon. And finally, I want you guys to remember this because this is very important. This is why groups like this exist. And I'm so, I'm praising God, right? Because you need a support group. You need friends. You need family. Have people in your circle that shares the same faith as you and are strong spiritually and emotionally. Friends that will tell you the truth in love. I have a group of friends. Let me tell you, when I go to them with the nonsense, eh, 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 no, no, no. What is that nonsense you come? Mm -mm, please move with that, please. What does God say? What does the Bible say? What, what is wrong with you? What have God has done for you? Like, why are you, why are you worried? Why are you stressed out? And they will be the ones to pull me back to the scriptures, to point me back to God. Instead of saying, you know what? Yeah, let's grease up and go fight our arms. Yeah, let's go grease up and go burn down the house and burn up what like nah, you want to stay away from those friends because they'll send you to jail, right? You want the ones that will take you and pray with you and encourage you in the Lord, in the scriptures, and he will they'll remind you of God's promises. Because sometimes it takes when you get to that place where the enemy is getting a con taking control of your mind and you feel so down. 
if you don't have a good friend to call and say, pray for me and pray with me, I'm telling you, you don't stand a chance. And that's why Satan loves to isolate. That's why right now one of his main tools is depression. And this whole Corona thing is working in his friend because it's, it's, it's isolating people. We don't get to see each other. We don't get to hug each other. We don't get to see each other. We don't get to spend time with one another. And that's what he wants because if you're not picking up the phone and calling you know, your friend to check in and say, you know, I don't feel good today. I'm like a tool. Can you pray with me? Can you pray for me? He knows he can sit you down in that corner and beat you down until you're just so emotionally and spiritually numb that you'll kill yourself. That's what he wants. And so having groups like this is extremely important. So if you know friends and females and family that you know can use the help or just might just need the encouragement or want the support, share this with them, share this group, send it to all your, your family members, people on the street, you might know a female, you just say, hey, this is a girl's group, it's empowering, it's spiritually uplifting, share, 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 because the more, the more people who know and we support each other, it's like a chain, you know, like we need each other, we need to support, we need to encourage, we need to strengthen and, up, and uplift each other. And that is how you grow, having people in your corner who are strong spiritually, strong emotionally. And even those that are weak, we can help them. The strong help the weak, the weak help the strong. And we all just, just holding on to each other, going into the kingdom of God together. And so I just want to remind you that the just shall live by faith. And being God's children, we don't walk by sight. We don't have to see the mountain move to believe that it can be. We walk by faith and not by sight. And I truly hope that you learn something today, that you will go forward and you'll, you'll share what you have learned and, and encourage somebody to, to trust God, to believe in him and to ask him, ask anything and that their joy might be full and that you'll just go forward and just be a blessing. And I pray that this truly was a blessing, it was a blessing for me and I pray that it was a blessing for you also. Thank you so much. Wow, wow, wow. Sister Shana, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. I feel like I need 30 seconds to, to sit in the power of the information that has just been shared. You know, there's, um, it really and truly was powerful. It really and truly was powerful. Um, um, I was completely enthralled and um, saturated in, in the just nourishment because sometimes, you know, even as a, a leader, even as a server, you know, you, you get tired, you know, you get tired and sometimes, you know, your faith gets affected and um, it's, it's really and truly was necessary. I can speak for myself and I could see it coming up here. So um, I just wanna say thank you so much. Uh, we're about to get into the, the real tea time now, which is the Q and &E. So at this point, this is where I'm gonna stop the recording just to protect everybody's privacy um, because we keep it in the, in the family. So I'm about to stop recording, but we have a few minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so what we would like to do is um, go ahead and raise your hand. If you don't know how to raise your hand, maybe just you know say, hey, um, uh, I have a question. Go ahead and unmute, turn your video on if you're, you know, feel like you want to do something like that. And so we could connect. Okay, let me, how do I turn off these recording thingies? Stop.